thanks to everyone for coming before the committee today. Um, I think we all appreciate the incredible work that foster families offer to young people and it's an invaluable service that's often, I think, underappreciated. It happens quietly in communities all over Ireland and it's important to acknowledge the work of those families and the difference they make in the lives of individuals as well as enriching families themselves. And I think as this is a public meeting, it's really important to highlight that. Um, when I was a child, I had a foster sister who was a teenager and I would cite it as one of the best things that ever happened to our family. Um, in your opening statements, you indicated concerns about the growth um, in the loss of foster carers overall and your engagement with current foster families indicated some of the challenges around that. Um, I'm just wondering if you could elaborate a bit more on the challenges of delays in permanency planning and the failure to increase allowances in line with inflation. Um, I'm wondering what are the difficulties around permanency planning and their impact and also should the committee be seeking for allowances to increase in line with inflation. Um, you spoke about some of the practical ways to support foster families, but I'm just wondering what are, are those practical ways. Um, you also highlighted difficulty in accessing therapeutic services for children. Um, this is an intersectional issue because this, the waiting lists for assessment of needs and therapies are absolutely disgraceful. And you spoke a bit about OT there, or speech and language therapy, but without the assessment of needs, it's not possible to get those therapies. So. Um, can you give us maybe an insight into how that is impacting the fostering system? Um, and finally, if you could discuss the specific challenges around recruiting and containing um, and retaining foster carers for kind of children and adolescents, the older children and adolescents. So if I, if I just, to, to maybe um, take that just in a couple of bite-sized parts, uh, just in relation to the allowance, I might ask the Director of Finance and Corporate Services, Pat, just to talk about the rate that is paid and when it was last changed or, um, or introduced. The rate is set by the department and, and is set in a regulation context, so TUSLA doesn't set a rate, it, it pays that rate. Um, uh, but, but just to say to you and, and, and to be upfront, it is my intention in the context of our foster care improvement plan, um, and the Minister has, has asked me uh, that question, it is our intention to put forward uh, an amendment to uh, the foster care allowance that is uh, provided. Uh, to try to more globally reflect the modern day demands that, that are yeah. involved in supporting a child in foster care, but maybe the rates, Pat, mm. if you could just <clears throat> clarify. Yeah, just to just clarify course. those, Deputy. I, they were set back in 2009, uh, 1st of January. Sorry, so we Chair, can hear you I can't of course. Can yeah, of thanks. Course. That's okay. Um, so I was just affirming or just confirming there that uh, the rates were set in 2009, I think most foster carers would be aware of that of the period of time so that's two rates uh, one for under uh, 12s of 325 a week and an over 12 to 18 of 352 and um, so there are some um, additional supports that can be brought in exceptional cases but they're the standard rates and they haven't increased since then and then if I go to the therapeutic side, just to say to you, the, um, I, I maybe just ask Kate to explain that the assessment of need, yes, would be a part of it, but, but just to say therapeutic services come in two streams in, in the health service, primary care, which is not associated with disability or assessment of need, and then disability assessment of need. So maybe Kate, as a former one of those therapists, would, would maybe explain that better. Yeah, well, I mean, the assessment of need process um, obviously is set out within legislation in terms of the child's right to an assessment of their need, and, and we do understand that there are delays um, in that process. When we talk about assessment of need, it's almost like an identification of need. So in terms of the model we're putting forward, it's not an assessment of need under a legislative basis. It's where we are going to meet with a young child, with the foster parents, with the birth parents, if required um, or necessary or appropriate, uh, to assess where that child's um, stands developmentally and then from that looking at designing a care plan and appropriate therapeutic supports to make sure that when that child uh, is in care that all of their needs are being met then so it is not just you know their physical and their safety needs but also obviously their developmental needs either um, you know through motor skills or speech and language skills or psychological supports that they may require. And uh, then on, I think on the other main part of your question, which is, well, what exactly are the issues that foster carers are telling us? Because I appreciate my opening statement didn't expand uh, on all of the detail of that. So what we did this year, 
Um, I, I've met a group of foster parents myself and they've left me in no doubt um, as to their view and then a lot of them would correspond with me individually and we try to respond on an individual basis but we do have to try and change the system rather than just individualising the response. So this year Kate directly went out and invited every foster carer in Ireland to come and talk to her. Uh, in regional sessions and maybe she could just paraphrase for you what, what it is they're telling us are the, the things we could do better. And, and maybe you say that's obviously as part of informing this plan that the CEO would have referenced um, for foster care that we are finalising and we would have engaged obviously with uh, foster carers but also with lots of different stakeholders, um, academics, you know, relevant department officials. But, you know, foster carers were very clear in the fact that they really believe in foster care obviously, as a placement option uh, for children can see the benefits of it. They were positive around, you know, our assessment process. They were positive around, you know, the training that was provided and where there was consistency with social worker. They were very positive about uh, their experience. But the challenges very much related to the turnover of staff. And I know Bernard is going to talk about that later in terms of recruitment and retention. So, you know, where there is a change in a young child's social worker, that does cause disruption both to the child and the foster carer. Uh, the lack of access to therapeutic supports, which we have just described. And it is also key that if we are trying to promote and retain foster carers, what is the model of different types of supports they need in order to be able to sustain a placement, particularly if a child is having some significant uh, difficulties. The lack of standardised approach to payments, which we have all uh, already referenced, and actually those engagements finished up in February, and immediately in February we have sent you know, some direction out to the system, particularly around the payment of medical expenses associated with assessment and, and making sure that there was clarity and, and consistency brought to that. They also talked about not being adequately involved in care planning for the young people that were in their care. And again, that was inconsistent. In some areas it was more positive, in other areas it wasn't. So we're very committed um, to ensuring that that becomes a much more consistent uh, approach to care planning, that the foster carers are seen as partners in care planning for the children. Uh, we've talked about the fostering allowance. And in relation to your question around permanency <coughs> planning, it is just very much the foster carers wish that where it is understood that a child is going to be in care for a longer period of time, that that is recognised um, earlier on and that we can look to more permanency planning around a placement for that child. Um, and so we are, as an agency, and, and, and as will be seen in that plan, significantly looking to address our approach to permanency planning for all children and young people in our care. And then I think there's there's one other piece to it, just, just to be of assistance to you. Um, foster carers individually would have experiences where they would feel we don't respond either appropriately to, to the problem or the issue and that's where a complaint arises and that's associated with the issue of safeguarding in foster care uh, and you will hear periodically reports from the sentencing courts uh, in relation to where things have gone wrong and I might just ask the Chief Social Worker just to, just to uh, address what it is we do about safeguarding in foster care because equally, conversely, foster carers sometimes experience that as not being supportive, but in fact it's actually an essential part of it. Do you just want to give a... Exactly, Deputy. So uh, again, we'd endeavour to uh, support the carers in the first instance and, and have a, an advocate with the carers themselves. Their own link worker would be part of that process. But again, we screen all those concerns through duty intake, the same as we would any concern that comes in. We try and take that independent and objective approach to it. And, you know, where concerns are founded and there's investigations done, they will be part of the new um, child abuse substantiation procedure that we're bringing in in June. They've been part of an independent process up to this as well, but this will be a new approach to it. Um, and that will be very clearly stated. There'll be really uh, clear information for the carers as they go into this. There'll be clear information for the children as well, and it'll be an independent investigation. So it's really important that, you know, while, while we're independent, that we also support the carers as part of that. So we try and take that balanced approach. Obviously, in, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, when we look at those complaints, they can be unfounded or they can be founded. Where they're founded, we obviously take appropriate steps to, first of all, safeguard the child if a child has to be removed. You know that we, that we do that, but that we do that, uh, you know, quickly when we find there's a, a need to be done, and that then in the longer term that we support that family to move on if there, if concerns because often it can be very upsetting for the foster family as well to think well they're under such huge introspection, so it can place real difficulties for that family to continue fostering. So we're really conscious of achieving a balance in that for those carers, and as people have here have said, appreciating the really significant work that families do, which isn't a workplace. It is a place where children grow and live. 
and mother and father, uh, parents, you know, parent their children. So it's not a it's not a work environment. So we do really appreciate that. So just on the la the last point, was the specific difficulty in recruiting foster families for older children and adolescents? Mm -hmm. Is there any kind of insight into? I I, I I think. Um, uh, firstly, to recognise it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, as I've said earlier, to Deputy Costello, family life, working life, and the construct of the family the king does change and keeps changing, and people live busier lives and different lives. Um, e older children, for example, in the cohort of separated children seeking international protection, like children coming from Ukraine and that, that's not as challenging to recruit for because there are a particular group of people who have a specific interest in that work. Okay. Um, but, but, but it really it comes down to the matching of the child. It's not that foster carers have a prejudiced view towards teenagers. It comes down to the matching of the child and the foster carers. And as I say, some, not all, but some of the teenagers who are presenting as needing our care um, might just present too much of, of a challenge. Um, and foster carers opt not to proceed with, with a placement in that. Um, I, if we can find particular ways that will support foster carers to do that, mm -hmm. we're not giving up on that. Uh, that's what we want to find and close out in the next few weeks to see. But, but I, I wouldn't want to give any false expectation about that either. I, I, it's a big challenge. What would, oh, sorry, yeah. Or, but just what would be the particular ways that could support foster families in that instance? Well, I, 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 I think there's, there's the practicality of just the care uh, of a teenager, depending on how disrupted their life might have been, depending mm. on whether they're coming into care or coming from another placement. Uh, there is the uh, foster care allowance in terms of the parent, foster care's ability to support the child and probably the mm. access to therapeutic supports for that young person in a way that yeah. they're able to engage with. Um, you might have the best therapeutic supports in the world, but 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 if, 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 a, if a 15 or 16 year old whose life is fairly chaotic Mm. and they've had some dreadfully traumatic experiences, can't interact with that, that's not going to meet the need right now. And I think also one of the um, issues that you'll see or one of the opportunities that you'll see in the plan that we're developing is around that shared care. So often foster carers may need more access to respite um, in terms of being able to sustain a placement. So it's looking at what the foster carers have told us would help them. Um, with the placements that they have at the moment. So foster carers that, you know, are fostering um, teenagers or, or older children have identified the need maybe for some additional respite. So, so that shared care approach is something, as well as the, the therapeutic supports that, that we see as um, supporting that. And then you'd have kind of two foster families and go to respite in one, is it? Or Pardon? Yeah, yeah. So, shared so it's care looking group. at that, yeah. And yeah, and maybe shared care, you'll see it in the plan within a network. So a foster carers network of supports that we could have a second almost foster family within that network who would support that foster carer. So certainly I'd be delighted to meet with you, Deputy, in terms of more detail around the plan that we are developing or, or any of the deputies here, or obviously when we have the plan written to meet with you to, to kind of talk you through the implementation that we are going to do. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Deputy Jennifer Manan O'Connor. Okay, well, I. I